Today we got some more actual history about Fanny Kelly from her book, Narrative of My Captivity Among the Sioux Indians, published all the way back in 1871. This episode takes place in December of 1864, five months into Fanny Kelly's captivity. Today we will see what happens to Fanny as the Blackfeet tribe she is with intend to take her to Fort Sully and try to use her return as a ruse for storming the fort and murdering the soldiers. Jumping Bear, who rescued me from the revengeful arrow of the Indian whose horse the chief shot, one day presented himself to me and reminded me of my indebtedness to him and thus preserving my life. Trembling with fear, I listened to his avowal of more than ordinary feeling, during which he assured me that I had no cause to fear him, that he had always liked the white woman, and would be more than a friend to me. I replied that I did not fear him, that I felt grateful to him for his kindness and protection, but that unless he proved his friendship for me, no persuasion could induce me to listen. Will you carry a letter to my people at the fort, delivering it into the hands of the great chief there? They will reward you for your kindness to their sister. They will give you many presents, and you will return rich. I dare not go, he replied, nor could I get back before the warriors came to our village. My people will give you a fast horse, said I, and you may return speedily. Go now and prove your friendship by taking the letter and returning with your prizes. I assured him that the letter contained nothing that would harm him or his people, that I had written of him and of his kindness, and of his good will toward them. After many and long interviews, the women of the lodge, using their influence, I at last prevailed upon him to go, and invoking the bright moon as a witness to my pledge of honor and truth, he started on his journey bearing the letter, which I believed was to seal my fate for weal or woe. In the moonlight I watched his retreating form, imploring heaven to grant the safe delivery of the little messenger, upon which so much depended. Daring and adventuresome deed, should he prove false to me and allow anyone outside the fort to see the letter, my doom was inevitable. Many days of intense anxiety were passed after his departure. The women, fearing that I had done wrong in sending him, were continually asking questions, and it was with difficulty I could allay their anxiety and prevent them from disclosing the secret to the other women. The contents of the letter were a warning to the big chief and the soldiers of an intended attack on the fort and the massacre of the garrison, using me as a ruse to enable them to get inside the fort and beseeching them to rescue me if possible. The messenger reached the fort and was received by the officer of the day, Lieutenant Hesselberger, and conducted to the commander of the post, Major House, and Adjutant Pell, who had been left there to treat with the Indians on my account. General Soley was absent at Washington, but every necessary precaution was taken to secure the fort. Jumping Bear received a suit of clothes and some presents, and was sent back with a letter for me which I never received, as I never saw him again. These facts I learned after my arrival at Fort Soley. The night before our departure from the Blackfeet village en route for the fort, I was lying awake and heard the chief address his men seriously upon the subject of their wrongs at the hands of the whites. I now understood and spoke the Indian tongue readily, and so comprehended his speech, which, as near as I can recollect, was as follows. Friends and sons, listen to my words. You are a great and powerful band of our people, the inferior race who have encroached on our rights and territories justly deserve hatred and destruction. These intruders came among us, and we took them by the hand. We believe them to be friends and true speakers. They have shown us how false and cruel they can be. They build forts to live in and shoot from with their big guns. Our people fall before them. Our game is chased from the hills. Our women are taken from us or won to forsake our lodges and wronged and deceived. It has only been four or five moons since they drove us to desperation, killed our brothers and burned our teepees. The Indian cries for vengeance. There is no truth nor friendship in the white man. Deceit and bitterness are in his words. Meet them with equal cunning, show them no mercy. They are but few, we are many. Wet your knives and string your bows. Sharpen the tomahawk and load the rifle. Let the wretches die who have stolen our lands, and we will be free to roam over the soil that was our fathers. We will come home bravely from battle. 
Our song shall rise among the hills, and every teepee shall be hung with the scalp locks of our foes. This declaration of hostilities was received with grunts of approval, and silently the war preparations went on, that I might not know the evil design hidden beneath the mask of friendship. That night, as if in preparation for the work he had planned, the gracious chief beat his poor wife unmercifully because she had murmured at her never-ending labor and heavy tasks. His deportment to me was as courteous as though he had been educated in civilized life. Indeed, had he not betrayed so much ignorance of the extent and power of the American nation in the address to his band, I should have thought him an educated Indian who had traveled among the whites, yet in his brutal treatment of his wife, his savage nature asserted itself, and reminded me that although better served than formerly, I was still among savages. When morning came to my sleepless night, I arose, still dreading lest some terrible intervention should come between me and the longed-for journey to the abodes of white men. The day before leaving the Blackfeet village, I gave all my Indian trinkets to a little girl who had been my constant companion, and by her gentle and affectionate interest in the captive white woman, had created within me a feeling akin to love. She was half white and was the granddaughter of a chief called Wichim Kiapa, who also treated me with kindness. The morning after the chief's address to his warriors, the Indians were all ready for the road and mounting in haste set up their farewell chant as they wound in a long column out of the village. I have frequently been asked since my restoration to civilization how I dressed while with the Indians, and whether I was clothed as the Indian wives were. A description of my appearance as I rode out of the Indian village that morning will satisfy curiosity on this point. My dress consisted of a narrow white cotton gown composed of only two breadths, reaching below the knee and fastened at the waist with a red scarf. Moccasins embroidered with beads and porcupine quills covered my feet, and a robe over my shoulders completed my wardrobe. While with the Oglalas I wore on my arms great brass rings that had been forced on me, some of them fitting so tight that they lacerated my arms severely leaving scars that I shall ever retain as mementos of my experience in Indian ornamentation. I was also painted as the Indian women were, but never voluntarily applied the article. It was winter and the ground was covered with snow, but so cold was the air that its surface bore the horse's feet on its hard, glittering breast, only breaking through occasionally in the deep gullies. It was 200 miles from the Blackfeet village to Fort Sully in the middle of winter, and the weather was intensely cold, from the effects of which my ill-clad body suffered severely. I was forced to walk a great part of the way to keep from freezing. Hoping for deliverance, yet dreading lest the treacherous plans of the Indians for the capture of the fort and the massacre of its garrison might prove successful, and my return to captivity inevitable, I struggled on, striving to bear with patience the mental and bodily ills from which I suffered. My great fear was that my letter had not fallen into the right hands. On our journey we came in sight of a few lodges, and in among the timber we camped for the night. While in one of the lodges, to my surprise, a gentlemanly-looking figure approached me, dressed in modern style. It astonished me to meet this good-looking, well-mannered gentleman under such peculiar circumstances. He drew near and addressed me courteously. This is cold weather for traveling. Do you not find it so? he inquired. Not when I find myself going in the right direction, I replied. I asked him if he lived in that vicinity, supposing, of course, from the presence of a white man in our camp, that we must be near some fort, trading post, or white settlement. He smiled and said, I am a dweller in the hills, and confess that civilized life has no charms for me. I find in freedom and nature all the elements requisite for happiness. Having been separated from the knowledge and interests of national affairs, just when the struggle agitating our country was at its height, I asked the question, Has Richmond been taken? No, nor never will be, was the reply. Further conversation on natural affairs convinced me that he was a rank rebel. We held a long conversation on various topics. He informed me that he had lived with the Indians for 14 years, was born in St. Louis, had an Indian wife with several children, of whom he was very proud, and he seemed to be perfectly satisfied with his mode of living. 
I was very cautious in my words with him, lest he might prove a traitor. But in our conversation some Indian words escaped my lips, which being overheard, rumor construed into mischief. What I had said was carried from lodge to lodge, increasing rather than diminishing, until it returned to the lodge where I was. The Indians, losing confidence in me, sent the young men at midnight to the camp of the white man, to ascertain what had been said by me, and my feelings toward them. He assured the messengers that I was perfectly friendly, had breathed nothing but kindliness for them, and was thoroughly contented, had so expressed myself, and there was no cause to imagine evil. This man trafficked and traded with the Indians, disposing of his goods in St. Louis and in eastern cities, and was then on his way to his home near the mouth of the Yellowstone River. Early in the forenoon of the last day's travel, my eager and anxious eyes beheld us nearing the fort. The Indians paused and dismounted to arrange their dress, and see to the condition of their arms. Their blankets and furs were adjusted. Bows were strung and the guns examined by them carefully. They then divided into squads of fifties, several of these squads remaining in ambush among the hills, for the purpose of intercepting any who might escape the anticipated massacre at the fort. The others then rode on toward the fort, bearing me with them. A painfully startling sight, the last I was destined to see, here met my gaze. One of the warriors in passing thrust out his hand to salute me. It was covered by one of my husband's gloves, and the sight of such a memento filled me with inexpressible dread as to his fate. Nothing in the least way connected with him had transpired to throw any light upon his whereabouts, or whether living or dead, since we had been so suddenly and cruelly separated. All was darkness and doubt concerning him. Mr. Kelly had been a Union soldier, and happening to have his discharge papers with me at the time of my capture, I had been able to secret them ever since, treasuring them merely because they had once belonged to him and contained his name. Now as we approached the place where his fate would be revealed to me, and if he lived we would meet once more, the appearance of that glove on the savage hand was like a touch that awakened many chords, some to thrill with hope, some to jar painfully with fear. In appearance I had suffered from my long estrangement from home life. I had been obliged to paint daily like the rest of my companions, and narrowly escaped tattooing by pretending to faint away every time the implements for the marring operation were applied. During the journey, whenever an opportunity offered, I would use a handful of snow to cleanse my cheeks from savage adornment, and now as we drew nearer the fort, and I could see the chiefs arranging themselves for effect, my heart beat high, and anticipation became so intense as to be painful. Eight chiefs rode in advance, one leading my horse by the bridle, and the warriors rode in the rear. The cavalcade was imposing. As we neared the fort they raised the war song loud and wild on the still, wintry air, and as if in answer to its notes, the glorious flag of our country was run up and floated bravely forth on the breeze from the tall flagstaff within the fort. My eyes caught the glad sights, and my heart gave a wild bound of joy. Something seemed to rise in my throat and choke my breathing. Everything was changed, the torture of suspense, the agony of fear, and dread of evil to come, all seemed to melt away like mist before the morning sunshine, when I beheld the precious emblem of liberty. How insignificant and contemptible in comparison were the flaunting Indian flags that had so long been displayed to me and how my heart thrilled with a sense of safety and protection as I saw the roofs of the buildings within the fort covered by the brave men who composed that little garrison. The precious emblem of liberty whose beloved stripes and stars floated proudly out seemed to beckon me to freedom and safety. And as the fresh breeze stirred its folds, shining in the morning light, and caused them to wave lightly to and fro, they came like the smile of love and the voice of affection, all combined to welcome me to home and happiness once more. 
An Indian hanger-on of the fort had sauntered carelessly forward a few minutes previous, as if actuated by curiosity, but in reality to convey intelligence to his fellow savages of the state of the fort and its defenses. Then the gate was opened, and Major House appeared, accompanied by several officers and an interpreter, and received the chiefs who rode in advance. Meanwhile, Captain Logan, the officer of the day, a man whose kind and sympathetic nature did honor to his years and rank approached me. My emotions were inexpressible. Now that I felt myself so nearly rescued, at last they overcame me. I had borne grief and terror and privation, but the delight in being once more among my people was so overpowering that I almost lost the power of speech or motion, and when I faintly murmured, Am I free? Indeed free? Captain Logan's tears answered me as well as his scarcely uttered yes, for he realized what freedom meant to one who had tasted the bitterness of bondage and despair. As soon as the chiefs who accompanied me entered the gate of the fort, the commandant's voice thundered the order for them to be closed. The black feet were shut out, and I was beyond their power to recapture. After a bondage lasting more than five months, during which I had endured every torture, I was once more stood free, among people of my own race, all ready to assist me and restore me to my husband's arms. Three ladies residing at the fort received me, and cheerfully bestowed every care and attention which could add to my comfort, and secure my recovery from the fatigues and distresses of my past experience. At first and some time afterward, at intervals, the effects of my life among the Indians preyed upon my mind so as to injure its quiet harmony. I was ill at ease among my new friends, and they told me that my eyes wore a strangely wild expression, like those of a person constantly in dread of some unknown alarm. Once more free and safe among civilized people, I looked back on the horrible past with feelings that defy description. The thought of leaving this mortal tenement on the desert plain for the wolves to devour and the bones to bleach under the summer sun and winter frosts had been painful indeed. Now I knew that if the wearied spirit should leave its earthly home, the body would be cared for by kind Christian friends and tenderly laid beneath the grass and flowers, and my heart rejoiced therein. Hunger and thirst, long days of privation and suffering had been mine. No friendly voices cheered me on. All was silence and despair. But now the scene had changed, and the all-wise being who is cognizant of every thought knew the joy and gratitude of my soul. True, during the last few weeks of my captivity, the Indians had done all in their power for me, all their circumstances and condition would allow, and the women were very kind. But their people were not my people, and I was detained a captive, far from home and friends and civilization. With Alexander Selkirk, I could say, Better dwell in the midst of alarms than reign in this horrible place. Being young and possessed of great cheerfulness and elasticity of temper, I was enabled to bear trials which seemed almost impossible for human nature to endure and live. Soon after my arrival at the fort, Captain Pell came and invited me to go to a trader's store to obtain a dress for myself. I needed it very much, having no clothing of my own to wear. A kind lady, Mrs. Davis, accompanied me, and the sight that presented itself to my wondering eyes will never be erased from my memory. By the doorsteps on the porches and everywhere were groups of hungry Indians of all sizes and both sexes, claiming to be friendly. Some of them were covered with every conceivable kind of superficial clothing and adornment, and critically wanting in cleanliness, a peculiar trait among the Indians of the Northwest. There was the papoose, half-breeds of any number, a few absolutely nude, others wrapped slightly in bits of calico, a piece of buckskin, or fur. Speculators, teamsters, and interpreters mingled with the soldiers of the garrison, Indian wives with their bright flashing shawls or red cloth, receiving in their looped-up blanket the various articles of border traffic, such as sugar, rice, flour, and other things, tall warriors bending over the same counter purchasing tobacco, brass nails, knives, and glass beads. 
all giving words to thought, and a stranger might well wonder which was the better prototype of tongues. The Cheyennes supplement their words with active and expressive gestures, while the Sioux amply use their tongues as well as their arms and fingers. To all, whether half-breed, Indian, or white man, the gentlemanly trader gave kind and patient attention, while himself and clerk seem ready and capable of talking Sioux, French, or English, just as the case came to hand. It was on the 12th of December when I reached the fort, and like heaven the place appeared after my trials of savagery. The officers and men were like brothers to me, and their tender sympathy united me to them in the strongest bonds of friendship, which not even death can sever. A party and supper was made for my special benefit, and on New Year's morning I was serenaded with cannon. Every attention and kindness was bestowed upon me, and to Dr. John Ball, post-surgeon, I owe a debt of gratitude which mere words can never express. He was my attendant physician during my sojourn at the fort, and as my physical system had undergone very severe changes, I needed great care. Under his skillful treatment and patient attention, I soon recovered health and strength. I had been severely frozen on the last days of my journey with the Indians toward the fort. Colonel Diamond from Fort Rice came to visit me ere I left Fort Sully. He was attended by an escort of 180 men. He told me of his efforts to obtain my release, and that he, with his men, had searched the Indian village for me, but found no warriors there as they had already taken me to the fort. The Indian women had made him understand by signs that the white woman had gone with the chiefs. He said the Indians were so enraged about giving me up that they killed three of his men and then scalped them by orders from the chief, Ottawa, who was unable to do any service himself, being a cripple. He bade them bring the scalps of the white men to him. An Indian who killed one of his men fell dead in his lodge the same day, which frightened his people not a little, for in their superstition they deemed it a visitation of the Great Spirit for a wrong done. Colonel Diamond did not forget me, neither did he cease in his efforts on my behalf. During all this time, no tidings had been received by me of my husband, but one day great commotion was occasioned in the fort by the announcement that the mail ambulance was on its way to the fort and would reach it in a few moments. An instant after, a soldier approached me saying, Mrs. Kelly, I have news for you. Your husband is in the ambulance. No person can have even a faint idea of the uncontrollable emotions which swept over me like an avalanche at that important and startling news, but it was not outwardly displayed. The heartstrings were stirred to their utmost depths, but gave no sound. Trembling, quivering in their strong feeling, they told not of the deep grief and joy intermingled there. Mechanically, I moved around, awaiting the presence of my beloved, and was soon folded to his breast, where he held me as if fearful of my being torn from him again. Not an eye present, but was suffused with tears. Soldiers and men, the ladies who had been friends to me, all mingled their tears and prayers. Language fails to describe our meeting. For seven long months we had not beheld each other, and the last time was on the terrible field of slaughter and death. His personal appearance, oh, how changed! His face was very pale, and his brown hair was now sprinkled with gray. His voice alone was unchanged. He called me by my name, and it never sounded so sweet before. His very soul seemed imbued with sadness at our separation, and the terrible events which caused it. My first question was concerning my little Mary, for her fate had been veiled in mystery. He gave me the account of her burial, a sad and heart-rending story, sufficient to chill the lightest heart. Of all strange and terrible fates, no one who had seen her gentle face in its loving sweetness, the joy and comfort of our hearts, would have predicted such a barbarous fate for her. But it was only the passage from death into life, from darkness into daylight, from doubt and fear into endless love and joy. Those little ones whose spirits float upward from their downy pillows, amid the tears and prayers of broken-hearted friends, are blessed to enter in at heaven's shining gate which lies as near little Mary's rocky, blood-stained pillow in the desolate waste as the palace of a king. And when she had once gained the great and unspeakable bliss of heaven, it must have blotted out the remembrance of the pain that won it, and made no price too great for such delight. 
In the far-off land of Indian homes where western winds fan hills of black, mid lovely flowers and golden scenes they laid our loved one down to rest. Where brightest birds with silvery wings sing their sweet songs upon her grave, and the moonbeams soft and pearly beams with prairie grasses o'er it wave. No simple stone e'er marks the spot where Mary sleeps in dreamless sleep, but the moaning wind with mournful sound doth nightly o'er its vigils keep. Keep. The careless tread of savage feet, and the weary travelers pass it by, nor heed they her who came so far in her youth and innocence to die. But her happy spirit soared away to blissful chimes above. She found sweet rest and endless joy in her bright home of love. So that's it for this episode. This is episode 16 in my series on Fanny Kelly, and after five months of captivity from July to December of 1864, she is finally free. She was captured at Little Box Elder Creek in Wyoming, and was freed at Fort Sully in South Dakota. If you haven't seen episode 10 in this series, you can watch that to hear more about the fate of little Mary Kelly. She was Fanny's niece and adopted daughter who was captured along with Fanny. Fanny had tried to send her back to the fort. She nearly made it there, but just a little ways away. She was found by Mr. Kelly, dead, with three arrows in her body. She had also been tomahawked and scalped. In the back of the book, there is a statement made by Lieutenant Hesselberger, which includes the contents of the letter that Jumping Bear had delivered to him. In the fall, after the expedition had been abandoned, the troops were scattered at different posts along the Missouri River, I with my company being left at Fort Sully in Dakota Territory. About the latter part of November, an Indian came inside the post. I, being officer of the day, asked him what he wanted. He said he came a long way and wanted to know if I was the big chief. If so, he had a paper for me to see. He gave it to me. It was a sheet torn out of a business book and numbered 76 in the corner. The substance of the letter was as follows. I write this letter and send it by this Indian, but don't know whether you will get it, as they are very treacherous. They have lied to me so often. They have promised to bring me to town nearly every day. I wish you could do something to get me away from them. If they do bring me to town, be guarded, as they are making all kinds of threats and preparations for an attack. I have made a pencil of a bullet so it might be hard to read. Please treat this Indian well. If you don't, they might kill me. After having the Indian remain for a few days and giving him plenty to eat, he was sent on his return with a letter to Mrs. Kelly. A short time after this, one morning, we discovered back of the fort on a hill a large body of Indians. The commanding officer was notified of the fact. He immediately gave orders to prepare the fort for defense. Since the warning received from Mrs. Kelly, we had been unusually watchful of the Indians. The fort was poorly constructed, having been built by soldiers for winter quarters. The Indians were notified not to approach the fort, and only the chiefs who numbered 10 or 12 were allowed to come inside the gates, bringing with them Mrs. Kelly, and when inside the fort, the gates were immediately closed, shutting out the body of Indians who numbered about 1,000 to 1,200. A bargain was made for her, and the articles agreed upon were delivered for her in exchange. I believe, and it was the opinion of others, that the advice and warning of Mrs. Kelly was very valuable to us, and was instrumental in putting us on our guard, and enabled us to ward off the threatened attack of the Indians. In my opinion, had the Indians attacked the fort, they could have captured it. The day that Mrs. Kelly was brought into the fort was one of the coldest I ever experienced, and she was very poorly clad, having scarcely anything to protect her person. Her limbs, hands, and face were terribly frozen, and she was put in the hospital at Fort Sully, where she remained for a long time, nearly two months for treatment. So according to Lieutenant Hesselberger, Fanny's letter was viewed as helpful in alerting the soldiers at Fort Sully of a possible attack. This series on Fanny Kelly's captivity by the Sioux Indians is almost over, but in the next episode we will hear a completely different account of Fanny Kelly's captivity, an account which is highly critical of Fanny's narrative. 
This channel is called Unworthy History because we cover actual history that is now deemed unworthy of being shown on history channels on TV. Stay tuned to this channel for more history directly from old books written by men and women whose shoes we are unworthy to stand in. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.